Pictures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Or go to our website. You can donate there through PayPal, scriptures4america.org. Our address again is Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. For us to continue to do what we're doing, we've got to have some of you do more in the way of prayer and giving. What we do do, we do as a network without commercials, without money drives, without begging for money. But some, sometimes we have to let you know we need a little more money coming in here because when you're about the Father's business, it's like any other business. You've got to have more inflow than outflow. And if you don't, You've got to do something different. Well, we are doing something different right now. We're making known to you our, our needs. That's something we don't normally do. We need your support. You need to take down this address. Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Or go to our website, scripturesforamerica.org, and donate through PayPal right there, scripturesforamerica.org. It is time for Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. All around the world, from the United States to Canada, Europe, Russia, South Africa, Australia, the Holy Spirit is stirring the hearts of godly Christians. The Bible says, quote, as an eagle stirreth up his nest, end quote. We invite you to stay tuned as Pastor Peter J. Peters shines the mighty light of the gospel on the source of our problems and the only solution. Please keep Scriptures for America in your prayers. And now, Pastor Peters. What I have for you at this hour in the morning is completely extemporaneous. I jotted this down in about ten minutes. I don't have a title for it. Maybe we'll give a title at the end of the message. But I was studying with a young man this morning as we were having our continental breakfast, sitting out on a beautiful ledge looking at the mountains that God's given us. And he was asking me honest questions, questions that were confusing to him. And what happens to a person sometimes as they study into a subject is they forget where they've come from. And sometimes we have to go back to basics. And it's good for me to sometimes go back to the basics and work on, say, teaching Freshman 101 rather than a senior class. Now, how many know what cognitive dissonance is? I'm curious, one or two of you. Well, cognitive dissonance is a situation that holds that the mind automatically and involuntarily rejects information that is not in line with previously accepted thought and belief. I'm going to go through that again. Cognitive dissonance holds that the mind automatically, now that's an important word, automatically and involuntarily rejects information not in line with previously accepted thoughts and beliefs. Now that's what we're dealing with at this time in Israel's history. Because the Antichrist, those who love a lie, and does not the Bible teach you that there are those who love a lie, have propagandized brain wars, there are various terminologies, our people. Now think about this, if you were an individual that loved to lie, what occupation would you take up? Farming? <laughs> No, you will take up occupations such as lawyer. Lawyer, hey, be easy on the lawyer. I've got a good lawyer here today, you know. He's just coming into the message. Hey, come back, come back. You know uh, why New Jersey has the toxic waste and New York has more lawyers? Because New Jersey had first choice. <laughs> Well, I suppose lawyers, but I was thinking about reporters. Well, think about it. Paul says easy. 
It's not in my notes, but our people have been conditioned to believe what is not true. And many of those beliefs are never questioned, especially when that information was given to them from what they deem was a reliable source. When you take a school child and put him in school and give him a textbook, and he's reading that he has no reason to believe that someone might be lying to him in his history book, you see. And then that child grows up, you have a generation who's been this conditioning process, has been the victim of it. And why did John the Baptist precede Christ? Because John the Baptist, now his day was not much different than ours. There was nothing new under the sun. You know, Herod was able to get by slaughtering all those little babies, three years old and, 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 and under, and he remained on the throne. But people accepted it. Just as they accept the slaughter of our babies today. There's no difference. But they had been conditioned, and John the Baptist had been sent to prepare the way. And what was the first thing he said? Repent. You see, he had to prepare the way for truths that were going to be given to them that were entirely contrary to anything they had been taught and learned. Now, the reason that the prophet's job is sometimes dangerous and causes him sometimes to be the main recipient at a rock party is because the people's hearts are not prepared. And when you give them a truth, they have been conditioned to accept something else as being entirely different than that truth. When you give that to them, they are not able to endure it. One time Jesus said to his disciples, I have more to tell you, but you're not yet able to what? To hear, or another translation says, endure it. Now, a good example of that, I don't think we'll turn there to the scripture, but it's in Acts chapter 7, I think it is, where Stephen got up and he preached a good sermon. Now, a lot of people think, well, you preach that sermon, you run everybody off. <laughs> You're fired down the road, preacher. You don't measure the success or the quality of a sermon by the number of people that walk up the aisle. If that's the case, then Noah was a failure as a preacher, was he not? You don't measure it that way. In the case of Stephen, it wasn't the rocks, it wasn't the people coming up the aisle, it was the rocks being thrown at him. And why? Because the scripture says that in Acts 7 verse 54, they held their ears and they gnashed their teeth. Stop it, stop it, I can't take it. You remember the story? It's a scriptural or spiritual message in it, although it's not a very nice movie to watch because of the language, but the story in the movie called They Live. When this man found these glasses that were made in a church, he had eyes that could see. And once he put them on, he saw everything different than the rest of the world. Things were black and white. Were they not? I can't tell you how many times in my life people have said, you know, your problem, Pete, is you see everything black and white. And my response to that has been over the years, the skunks are black and white. And there's a lot of skunks in church pews that pray for colorblind preachers. Isn't it true? But I'm off the subject. When he put the glasses on, not only did he see things different than the world, but it gave him a headache. Have there ever been times in your search and quest for truth that you think, oh, I got, I, let's get back off a while. I want something lighter. Have you ever had that? Because it's a, it's a process. It's, it's a real thing. John the Baptist prepared the hearts. And let me tell you this. If you're not a repentant person, your heart's not honest. If you're not surrendered to Christ, I don't care how eloquent or how logical my presentation of the truth might be, it will do no good. You have to have that preparation. At this camp, I hope to have both. The heart being prepared and the truth being given. John prepared the way. Now, if you don't love the truth, no matter how much it hurts, let me tell you something right now. This is not a sermon. I'm going to try to make it a lesson. But you don't love Christ. If you want to argue with me about 2 plus 2 equals 4, and you want to say 5, let me tell you something. You don't love Christ. Because he said, I am the way and the truth. Now, I found out early on in my Christian walk that truth is not of paramount importance to the churches of our land today. What's important is the feel-good. 
the bunny hugs and the praise, the lords and sisters. There's nothing wrong with praising and singing. But it's hypocrisy when we do that and expel the truth. Amen? Amen. So, if you love the truth, and there's a battle going out there, a lot of people say it's a spiritual battle. Yeah, it is a spiritual battle. Yeah, it's the devil, but the devil wears suit pants sometimes. You see what I'm saying? And when that battle rages and you love the truth and the people over there on the other side who hate a lie confront you, they hate the truth. Do you believe that? Do you understand? Do you not read in the Psalms? Have you not read in the New Testament Scriptures those that hate the truth? And when they find a group that love the truth, guess what they call them? A hate group. I stand, if that's the way you're defining it, guilty as charged. You can call it a hate group, but my God calls it a group that loves the truth. Regardless if it's hard to take, and sometimes it is a little bit hard to digest, isn't it? When we've been conditioned these other things. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now the problem I have found arise in my ministry is that there are times you are confronted with an audience that need milk, yet they need food, meat. Those little babies out there are doing well on milk, wouldn't do so well on meat, right? The long line, they're going to need heavier food. So there are times when you try to give the meat and the people that are needing the milk are there in the audience, it can choke them. So what I want to do here is give some of the meat. Now, a lot of times people say, well, you don't have love. You know, you don't have any concern for people's feelings. Well, the reason they say that is sometimes the truth, what? It hurts. It hurts. <laughs> It's not that you necessarily want to hurt them, but you've got to put the truth out. You know, I can remember as a boy, I had polio back in the 50s when I was about uh, eight or nine years old. Uh, I had crippling polio. I was in the children's hospital in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I tell you, I, the hospital was bigger than the town I came out of in Nebraska. It was quite an experience. But I can remember how it used to be kind of like, uh, uh, I considered it going down to be tortured. They used to come, I used to dread this time of day. They'd come with one of those little, little gurneys and they'd put me on the gurney and the nurse is so sweet and nice and you're laying there and you're, you're, you're nervous because they're rolling you down the, the hall into the elevator, down the elevator, and you go down in the basement. And as soon as you get out of that basement the elevator onto the basement hall, you hear the screams from the torture chamber. I mean, they were screaming and crying. <laughs> it, was, it was really scary. <laughs> and... Uh, and I'd go in there, and there would be these therapists, and there would be tables after tables of these therapists along the wall. And let me you, nurse, you ever seen something like that? Anyway, these therapists there, and then I can remember trying to butter them up, kind of soft, and try, I tried to, you know, talk to the lady. But they're just cold and hard, you know. And she'd put me down on that table, and sometimes they'd strap your legs down, and sometimes they'd start trying to make you touch your toes, because your muscles had all shrunk up, you see. And, oh, it hurt bad, you know. And sometimes I'd try to pull my toes back as I was going forward, and then they'd yell at me, don't pull them toes back, you're cheating, you know. But now, you know, at that time in my life, I thought that woman hated me. You know, as I've gotten older and more mature, though, I bet she loved children, what do you bet? And sometimes love inflicts pain because that's good for you, Right? Well, so much for the introduction. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to give you some points in Scripture I learned after I got out of Bible college. Frankly, I was converted in a group they called themselves a New Testament church. And if you look at it, most of the Scripture today is taken from the New Testament in Judeo-Christianity. The ones that are not are more taken as an motivational thing from the Old Testament. But there's a reason God gave us the Word. All scripture is inspired of God. 
and profitable for teaching the truth and correction. Amen? But what happens if you take two-thirds of the scriptures and toss it out? You lose a lot of profit. Well, here's something else. We're going to look at some Bible history because I didn't quite understand Bible history. To me, that was, and this is the way it's summed up in the religious world today, the Old Testament was a story about God dealing with the Jews. And the New Testament, though, is he now came and made a covenant with the Gentiles. All are acceptable, Jew or Gentile. In Christ, there's no difference. Male or female, et cetera, et cetera. You ever heard those things? All right. So they don't know the history. There was a man by the name of George Orwell who wrote a book called 1984 and had an interesting thing to say about history. He said, he who controls the past controls the future. Did he not? And he who controls the present controls the past. Now, there is so much truth to that. I have found the history we're being told is absolute lie after lie. White man came to slaughter all buffalo. White man was a terrible individual that destroyed the environment. The Indians were great conservationists. I'm telling you something, those are lie, lie, lie. That might even, that, even even saying that right now, that might be hard for you to take. Because it doesn't line up from what you got from the authorities. Well, if you wanted to control the future, now, as you say, I don't want to control the future, but if you were an evil individual that wanted to enslave, steal, rob, pillage, you would like to have that power to control the future, wouldn't you? Well, to do it, all you have to do is control the past. And the same thing has happened in our churches. They do not know the past. Now, what got me on this extemporaneous lesson was the man was asking me about the word Gentile. And the word Gentile as far as the Judeo-Christian world is concerned, is defined to mean what? A non... A non-Jew. The word Gentile does not mean non-Jew. Now that in itself is a pretty major revelation. Reason. Because if you don't understand what the word means, when you read the passage that the word's in, you will not understand the passage. Right? We've also been conditioned that the word Jew has to mean, must mean, at all times, God's chosen people. Yeah. We were conditioned that way. So I wanted to know about this word Gentile. So let's go back in history. I want us to look at some Bible history. Genesis 1 is in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Remarkable how the Bible is. You know, what is it? Science has come up with that there's five things. Uh, in our creation time in the beginning force God uh, created uh, matter the he- uh, uh, I mean space the heavens matter the earth it's right there from there we read about some men that came on the scene we read about Noah and the flood and then we come to Genesis chapter 12 and a man comes on the scene and his name is Abram now listen to me From that point on, the Bible is about for, because, or pertains to this man, Abram, who we find in Genesis 17 had his name changed to Abraham, and a covenant was made with Abraham. Let's read the covenant. I know for some of you this might be old hat, for others of you it's just as new, as new can be. Genesis chapter 17, we'll begin with verse 1. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. We'll stop there a second. I want you to know I'm reading from the New American Standard. Your translation might be a little different. Uh, And I will establish, verse 2, my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Now what was involved in this covenant? God said he was going to make a multitude of nations out of Abraham, or Abram. Verse 5, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you a father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and, very important man there, your descendants after you throughout their generations for 
an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Now, we won't spend a lot of time there, but let's look at some points. He's going to be a father of a multitude of nations. And that covenant extends on to his descendants. But I don't want to be a, I don't want to be part of the covenant. You know, I'm so I don't want to be a, I don't care what you want. I don't care what you believe. It doesn't make any difference. When God says it's going to be that way, it's going to be that way. Amen? Amen. Well, I didn't know I was part of it. I don't care if you knew it or not. It doesn't make any difference. When God says it, that's the way it is. These people who are going to form a multitude of nations are going to be his covenant people, like it or not. Well, who wouldn't like it? A bunch of idiots wouldn't like it. <laughs> and as we see, that's what we're dealing with. They want somebody else to be it. Let them have it. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Well, there's the covenant. He's going to be the father of a multitude of nations. Now, how many Christians can honestly say, those who say they know Jesus, can honestly say they understand the history from henceforth, from this passage onward? They can't. Yet the scripture says to them, study to show thyself approved. As a workman that ought not to be ashamed, that we should be ashamed as far as the Judeo-Christian world is in whole, uh, as whole, because they don't know. They haven't studied. They don't understand this. They don't understand what took place. Okay. All they know is that there was this Jew by the name of Abraham. Hold it. You show me in the Bible where Abraham was ever called a Jew. And he wasn't. You see, we've been conditioned, Old Testament for the Jews, New Testament for the Gentiles, no matter difference, just cut it off. And let me ask you something. How many have studied the history of the Chinese? How many are extremely history, interested in the history of the Chinese? <laughs> well, of course not. Because it doesn't pertain to you. And we've been conditioned to believe that this doesn't pertain to us, but all along it's our book, you see. So, that might help answer what difference does this make? If you don't know your history, somebody can manipulate your future. So, here's the history. God's going to make a multitude of nations out of Abraham. Abraham had a child by the name of Isaac. In fact, if you turn the page, you'll see in verse 18, verse 19 rather chapter 17 of Genesis but God said but no Sarah your wife shall bear you a son and shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after them Isaac and his sons Isaac's sons you know we got people in our midst right now whose last name is Isaacson we got other people whose names are Saxons well, think about that a second so it's going to be through Isaac. Isaac then had a child, two of them, Jacob and Esau. Now I'm going to move past Jacob and Esau for the temporary time because I want to center in on the nations. Uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. But I want you to understand this, even though it's going to be hard for you to accept, and even though you might reject it, even though you might not even say it, it's important. But Abraham wasn't called a Jew in the Bible. Isaac wasn't called a Jew in the Bible. And Isaac's son, Jacob, who received this covenant, was not called a Jew in the Bible either. Now, you might call him a Jew, and your preachers certainly call him a Jew. But if you want the truth, the truth of the matter is they were never called Jews. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And he fathered 12 sons who in turn brought about the 13 tribes of Israel. It was those people the Israelites that God took out of Egypt brought through the Red Sea into the promised land and it was those people that formed a nation and their first king was who? yeah the first king was Saul man I give the man wrong information this morning I said David hope he's not here <laughs> first king was Saul the next king was David but the point is this, not the kingship, but the point is they were now a nation. How many nations? One. How many are they going to become? Many. Many or God's a liar. Right? So, as we read on in history then, those people, who were not called even Jews at that time, those people formed two nations. Now, David's son was Solomon. He took the throne. After Solomon, his son, Rehoboam, took the throne. 
How many get Rehoboam and Jeroboam confused? I'll give you a hint, okay? I always remember it this way. Rehoboam rearranged things. And this is how he rearranged it. Because of his stupidity, and we'll not turn there because of time, but you can read about it. It's there in the scriptures. I think it's um, 1 Kings chapter 12. Uh, his foolishness, he taxed the people too hard and there was a rebellion in the land. It's somewhat like the North and the South. Prior to the Civil War, there was only one nation. After the Civil War, had the South won, there would have been two nations, right? In this case, there was a Civil War, North against South. The ten northern tribes split off from the two southern tribes. There was a civil dispute and a split. And now we have two nations. The one was called the House of Judah. The other one was called the House of Israel. This message is to center in more on the word Gentile than it is Jew. But let me say this. Words change with time. In the King James translation, there's a word that says prevent. Let me know what prevent means. It means totally opposite as to what it means today. In King James' time, he said, prevent him to come before me. That meant allow him to come. Today, when they say prevent him from coming before me, it means entirely different. So I want you to understand something, that meanings of words do change. We have somewhat of a living language, do we not? They change with time. Also, to understand the meaning of a word, you've got to know the context. How many know what the word bill means? Or bark. You don't know the meaning of those words unless you look at the context in which they're used. Bark can be the sound of a dog or something on the side of a tree. A bill can be something you receive in the mail from public service or part of a duck's anatomy. You see what I'm saying? And that's no different with the word Jew. We're dealing with the word Jew today when people have been conditioned that Jews are God's chosen people. These people who run Wall Street, who have the land of the Israelis over there, so forth, that they are God's chosen people, you see. Well, that word is being used different, is different today than what it was even in the time of Judea. Now, if you lived, how many Texans were there at the time of, uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War? None. There might have been people living in that geographical area, but Texas didn't exist. You see. Now, once te Texas exists and you come from Texas, what are you called? Louisian? You ever heard this cowboy come walking in? All do it up, and somebody said, Hello, partner, what's your name? He said, Tex. He says, Where are you from, Tex? He says, Louisiana. <laughs> Louisiana? He said, Why do they call you Tex? He said, You ever heard a cowboy called Louise? <laughs> no, but if you're from Texas, you're called Texan. Now, if you were from the house of Judah, that nation of Ju Judah, where the capital was in Judea, what do you suppose eventually you would be called? A Jew. You see what I'm saying? Now you start having the evolving of what, when this word came about. But I want to center in more on the word Gentile. What does it mean? Well, we had a division. Now we have the house of Israel and the house of Judah, two nations. But how many did God promise Abraham? Many nations. This is a simple, really, lesson if you look at it and think about it. Now, you're not going to understand much of the Old Testament if you don't understand this division because some of the prophets were sent to one nation, others were sent to the other nation. They weren't just sent to the Jews, they were sent to the Israelites, and by this time there's two nations. The prophet Hosea was sent to the ten northern tribes, which was called the house of Israel, and he made a very, very important prophecy. Oh, what's that Old Testament prophecy? I mean, it. Yes, it does have everything to do with Christianity today, because you'll find it in what we call the New Testament scriptures. First of all, let's look at it in the Old Testament. Hosea chapter 1. I'm not going to go into all these names and what Hosea had to do. I want to send in on verse 1 to see what God prophesied through him. He said in verse 4, I mean, verse 4, And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. There was a prophecy. Hosea was sent to the ten northern tribes. You see what had happened? Is they had become so sinful... God said, enough is enough. I'm going to spank you good. I'm taking away your nation. That's what the word kingdom means. I'll put an end to the house of Israel, the kingdom. Drop on down. In verse 7, we find a very important 
yet or but. It says, But I will have compassion on the house of Judah, and will deliver them by the Lord their God, and will not deliver them by soul, sword, battle horse, or horseman. All right, now what happened? Well, brief history. The house of Israel was taken into Assyrian captivity. The Assyrians came down as in, from the north. They were a world ruling power at the time. They attacked the house of Israel. But they didn't want just the house of Israel. They wanted the whole works. They wanted the house of Judah too. Now, some Christians have heard some preacher somewhere sometime tell about some story about how Jerusalem was surrounded and they went to just clean their plow and then the next day the commander woke up and a bunch of people are dead. You ever heard that story? What was that story about? It was about the prophecy that God made to these people through Hosea. You know, but I won't spare it by sword of battle. It was by miracle. You see what I'm saying? Now, the way the conquest worked in those days was that once they conquered a people, they would remove those people. They moved them out of the land and would put them on the outer banks of their existing empire. So that if anybody else attacked, they'd have to come through those people. Plus, they had less problems with uprising and rebellion because the people were removed from their surroundings. You see what I'm saying? And literally millions of people were moved during the Syrian captivity and they were moved north and west. And now, at this point in time, most of Judeo-Christianity will say that those people went out of existence. They homogenized with the other people and we've heard from them no more. But let's see what Hosea says in verse 9. And the Lord said, Name him no am I, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. And what he's saying there in paraphrase form, he says, As far as I'm concerned, this is it. The divorce is final. I'm not your husband, you're not my wife. I'm not your God, you're not my people. Sit. And they say, Oh, what's going to happen to me? What about me? Instead of being like Matt Butler there and Gone with the Wind, who said, Frank, my dear, I don't care. <laughs> I fooled you, didn't I? When they say, what about me? This is what God said about their future in verse 10. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it will come about that in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. Two things here. First of all, what's going to happen to their numbers? They're going to increase, not go out of existence. Secondly, What's going to happen to their future? They're going to become sons of God. Who are sons of God today? The Christian. Through Christ. And verse 11. The sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be brought back together again. Hey, you know what, how important that was? That's kind of like getting Richard Hoskins up here to sing... Glory, glory, hallelujah. He's from the south and he doesn't like that song. You see what I'm saying? There was a great animosity between these people. They had warred for centuries. And now here's a prophecy. Not only are you going to grow and not only are you going to become sons of God, but on top of all that, you're going to join together with the house of Judah. Now that's a miracle. Amen? Going on in verse 11. And they will appoint for themselves one leader. And they will go up from the land of Jezreel, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Okay, keep that passage of scripture, Hosea 1, verse 10 and 11, in your mind, okay? Let's go on in history. They were taken into Syrian captivity. A few centuries later, the house of Judah, that nation, was taken into Babylonian captivity. Now that's the captivity most people know about in the Judeo-Christian world, because they know that David, excuse me, Daniel was of that captivity. And they know that after 70 years, they went back and rebuilt the temple. They, moved, they went back. Now, stop and think about this. There is no such thing as a vacuum. When they were taken out of the land, someone else came in and took those houses and took those vine groves and took those farms. You see what I'm saying? So when they went back, there were still people living in the Judea area. And they resettled there, rebuilt the temple walls, I mean the walls of Jerusalem and the, the temple. That's what you read about in Ezra, Nehemiah. That's that story. Still with me? Is it clear so far? Now they're all living in Judea, and guess what they're called from Judea? Louisians? No, they're called Jews. 
but are they all Israelites? No. no, they aren't. They're mixed now. Samaritans, Edomites, Herod, though you might call him a Jew, he was an Edomite. A descendant of Esau, you see. All right. Where do I go here? We'll go over to Jeremiah chapter 50. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 17, we are told what has happened to these people. What's another term for these people? The sheep of his pasture. Israel is his sheep. Verse 17. By this time, the Babylonian captivity has taken place, the Assyrian captivity has taken place, and let's see, I think I'm right. Yeah, that's the way it was. In Jeremiah 50, verse 17, we read, Israel is a scattered flock. The lions have driven them away. The first one who devoured him was the king of Assyria. The last one who has broken his bones is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. What's he talking about? He's talking about this flock who's had two separate scatterings. You with me so far? Now what's this got to do with Christianity? Well, turn over to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, Christ has said something that has caused the Jews, the people living in Judea, some Israelites, some are not, they're all following this thing called Judaism, or the Phariseeism, and they caused them to question something in verse 35. The Jews therefore said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we shall not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? Now, here we find that they knew about a dispersion. If you look the word up, it means Israel in other countries. It's number 1290, if you want to check me out, in Strong's. And I think I took this out of Holman's. I think both say the same. Israel and other countries. It's only used three times in the New Testament. Here, also it's used over in the book of James, chapter 1. It says, James 1, verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. And there's that word again, dispersed. I remember my James class in Bible college we start off in James in the James class. Guess where you start? James 1.1. 1, 1. And the first thing I was told by my instructor that the 12 tribes dispersed abroad is the church. I raised my hand, but I said, but it doesn't say the church. Well, that's what it means, is the church. You know what I think it means? It's pretty deep. I think it means 12 tribes. <laughs> well, I was no professor, so what could I say, you know? Twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Peter also uses that same thing, the chosen, in First Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 1. We'll not turn there. All right, let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Now, as we turn there, remember what Jeremiah said. Israel, his sheep, had two scatterings. One by the Assyrians, one by the Babylonians. Now, notice what Christ said in John, chapter 10, verse 16. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. Remember I told you to remember Hosea 1, 10 and 11? Where the house of Israel and the house of Judah would be joined together under one leader? And now he's talking about one flock coming together. Who's he interested in? You say, oh, I'm not interested in this. I did anything. I'm interested in the love of Jesus. Well, let's look at the love of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. Here we read in verse 24, Christ speaking to the Canaanite woman. A Canaanite is not an Israelite. A Canaanite is not a sheep of his pasture. And it says in verse 24, But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Was in Christ interested in this lost sheep? Certainly. Now, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 8. And if this doesn't make sense, it's on tape. You're going to be able to listen to it sometime. Stop the tape. Look at the scriptures. Check these things out. As we turn to Hebrews 8, remember this, that in the Christian world today, everyone is cognizant of this fact that Christ established a new covenant. 
The church I was converted in, they knew about the new covenant. They could take you to Hebrews chapter 9, show you where it took place, took place at the death of the testator, so forth, so on. But there's one thing they don't seem to be able to answer correctly, or let me put it this way, biblically. Who was the new covenant made with? It's pretty important, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Man, I made this deal. I made this deal with this guy, and it's a good deal for him because he's going to get all this and that and so forth and so on. And uh, say, well, who, who this, who's the deal made with? Oh, that's not important. The thing is, we made the deal, you know. What well, is important, particularly if you're part of that deal, right? Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This new covenant we call the Christian covenant was made with who? House of Israel and the house of Judah. Jesus said, I have another fold and I'm going to bring them into one. Where is he going? Is he going to the dispersion of among the Greeks, dispersed Israel. Hosea said, House of Israel and House of Judah would be brought back together under one leader. And they would be called sons of God. And what are Christians called? Is it coming together? Now let's go to Romans chapter 9. Because really what I'm trying to do is answer this word Gentile. Starting with verse 24, Romans 9. Even us, whom he also called, not among Jews only, but also among Gentiles. And let's stop there a second. The purpose of this message is not to talk about the word Jew, simply to say this at this point in time. I do have a tape called The Most Confusing Word in Scripture. That word was very confusing to me in my struggle to get to the truth. But I want to center in on the word Jew. Think of this word Jew here, I mean the word Gentile. The word Jew here, think of it the Judeans or the house of Judah, but also among the Gentiles. We have been conditioned to think of the Gentiles as being who? Non-Jews. Who are the Gentiles? Next verse, 25. And he says also in Hosea. Your translation might use a different word, but it's the same man, Hosea. How do I know? Look at what the quote is. I will call those who were not my people, my people. Who did Hosea say in Hosea 1.10 would be called not his people? The house of Israel, these Israelites. And her who was not beloved, beloved. Who did he divorce? I don't love you anymore, baby, down the road. You see? But I love you now. Verse 26. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people... There they shall be called sons of the living God. Now in the context, who are the they? The Gentiles, he's just told you. And what does the word Gentile mean? Look it up. It means nations. Or nation. And what did God promise Abraham? His seed would form a multitude of? Nations. And those nations laid to the west, and the gospel was taken to them. And what was happening? It all ties back to Genesis 12, this man Abram, Genesis 17, this covenant. Isn't this exciting? It is to me. They had been dispersed abroad, and he's bringing them back. But, you say hallelujah. Oh yeah? Well, suppose you were a southerner. Back in 18-something, Ten years after the war, whatever. And I come telling you, you know something? Your Yankees are going to come to your brothers again. How would you like that? You'd say, those darn Yankees. I'm improving, aren't I? Huh? Well, you know what the house of Judah was saying? Those uncircumcised. Because they were circumcised, the others were not, right? But he's your brother. I don't care. He deserved to be cut off. James, am I infringing upon your territory when you're going to be talking this week about the prodigal son? But isn't this part of the story? James Brigham is going to be talking about the prodigal son. There's way more of that story than you ever dreamed. There were two brothers, and the one brother didn't like the other brother coming back, you see. They're Gentiles. There was a conflict. But the conflict was not because it was Jew versus non-Jew. It's the house of Israel, house of Judah, being brought together in one fold, but they were all Israelites, the sheep of his pasture. 
Does that make sense? And then again, everyone says, well, what about the Jew? What about you? Why do you say that? Because you have been so conditioned to think that the only person that's important today is this thing called Jew. You don't ever hear them say, hey, what, about, what about the Saxons? What about the, uh, what about the Anglos? What about the, with the white race? You ever hear that? No. If you hear that, you've been conditioned to think that that's got to be a hate monger. Well, what about the Jew? Does the Jew mean Hebrew or Israelite? We've got writings to show, quoting their own writings. The uh, Jewish Almanac in 1980 says it's incorrect. They, in their own words, to call a modern day Jew an Israelite. Well, what should we call him then? What should we call him then? Now, I studied this. Let's be scriptural about it, huh? Let's not be hateful people, huh? Let's be scriptural. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. We don't want any non-love here. In verse 9. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. I think you people better learn love. If you're going to call them anything, call them the synagogue of Satan. You start examining their fruits. I did this a long time ago. Who is it that has a religion that believes in abortion, whoremongering, prostitution, usury, white slavery, socialism, and on and on? You might not know, and this isn't part of the message, but let me tell you something. I've studied it out. And it's people who claim to be one thing but are not. And guess what they claim to be? God's chosen people. The Jews. But they lie. You mean someone would lie to me, Pastor Peters? You know what, Pastor Peters? I think you're lying to me. This sounds like white supremacy. This sounds like neo-Nazism. Well, when you say that, it sounds to me like you need to learn about cognitive dissidence. You see what I'm saying? Now, the great story is this. The truth is getting back out. Not just that the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and kindred people who did form a multitude of nations in keeping with God's prophecy, who did come to America in keeping with God's plan, are those people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites, who now have been brought back together in one fold if they accept the blood of Christ, if they believe in him as the great I am who became flesh and dwell among us, and if they repent of their ungodly sins because they're the, they're the best sinners in the world. Amen? Amen. If there's anything supreme about them, that they're the supreme race of sinners. And if they'll be baptized for the remission of sins, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the Scriptures. If they don't found, seem acceptable to you, it might just be that you are a victim of this cognitive of dissidence. But it's just not that we're describing and discovering that, but we're also not just describing or discovering who the true Israel people are. We are discovering and we are determined by the Spirit of God to make it known who they are not. And it's not these people called Jews today. Well, that's a fast, brief, extemporaneous overview of what this message is about. Does it clear things up for some? Amen. You like that one? Okay, we'll conclude with that. Thank you for joining us here on Scriptures for America, broadcasting on Worldwide Christian Radio. The message you just heard, Jews, Gentiles, and Basic ID by Pastor Peters. If you liked it, you can get a copy of it on tape or CD. You get to specify. We ask for a $5 offering. You write to Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Oport, Colorado, 80535. That address again is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. We have another message coming up at the top of the hour, but first we're going to try to finish this out with a little music. Before we get to the music, I want to remind you this ministry is supported by your tithes and your offerings. You can send support to the address I gave you before. You can also send support directly to WWCR to help pay our broadcasting bills because we're broadcasting over 400 hours a month on Worldwide Christian Radio and that doesn't come free. If you'd like to send your support directly to Worldwide Christian Radio, you send it to WWCR 1300 WWCR Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee 
37218. I'm going to give it to you one more time. WWCR 1300 WWCR Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee 37218. Two addresses. And if you do send support there, please be sure to specify that it is for Pastor Peters and it's for Scriptures for America so that it goes to the the right the right account and you can do that anonymous, anonymously if you'd like you can let us know that you did it so we can keep keep up with who's helping us out but that's the address to send that to directly to Worldwide Christian Radio here we go with some music to finish out the hour before we get to another message at the top of the hour stay right here on Worldwide Christian Radio It's a grief and I must bear it But I won't bear it alone I know my Savior loves me Someday He'll take me home I'll be there in that city He'll wipe away the tears Roll away the burden. Take away the fears A single woman with little kids Her husband is gone Trying to raise a family Is hard when you're all alone Long days and lonely nights Trying to do right being two and you're only one and the devil to fight. It's a grief and I must bear it, but I won't bear it alone. I know my Savior loves me, someday he'll take me home. I'll be there in that city, he'll wipe In a darkened room, late at night, a man sits all alone. On his desk there is a stack of bills, no way to pay them on his own. He'll probably lose his business, how can he tell his wife? How can he face his family? How can he face his life? It's a grief and I must bear it But I won't bear it alone I know my Savior loves me Someday he'll take me home I'll be there in that city He'll wipe away the tears Roll away the curtain Take away the a man beside a graveside Standing all alone Looking down upon a casket Before they put it in the ground In the casket there's a lady The love of his life The mother of his children that lady is his wife It's a grief and I must bear it But I won't bear it alone I know my Savior loves me Someday he'll take me home I'll be there in that city He'll wipe away the tears Roll away the burden, take away the fear.
Listening to Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. Should you want to write, the address is Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Our fax number is Country Code 01 307 745 5914. Again, that is Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Fax number. This is the prayer for the Scriptures for America getting elite prayer warriors for the winter of 2017. O oh Lord, you know our wickedness. You know our sins. Oh, how the blood of the millions of aborted innocent Israelite children must cry out to you and grieve you and your heavenly hosts. Father, your word is clear in Genesis that you heard the voice of Abel's blood crying out unto you from the ground. If the blood of one innocent man can move you, then we, your people, who are called by your name, ask, O Lord, that you hear the blood of the countless innocent children offered up on the altar of Baal, slain in human sacrifice against you and your throne. 